Welcome to the Matt Sager Podcast. It's September 19th, Wednesday, New Comic Book Day. Perhaps appropriate, then, that I should finally answer questions I've been asked since yesterday about how I feel, what my opinions are regarding Captain Marvel, the trailer that dropped yesterday. Do I have thoughts? Do I have opinions? Why have I casually mentioned from time to time on this podcast that both as a kid and as an adult, I love and have loved comics, and yet just dropped it. You mentioned it, that you had a childhood in which you enjoyed comics. You mentioned that at Westwood One, you worked in the same building as many people at DC with whom you're still friends. I'm not sure if I mentioned that as a young adult in the early 90s, I was friends and co-workers with the great comedian and comic writer Brian Posehn, who was a massive comics fan and convinced me at that time, a pivotal time in my young adult life, I think I was 22. So to be convinced then of the validity and the fact that it would be okay to enjoy comics is both great and something I've always been grateful to Brian for, and also a bit ironic, because I don't think there's ever been a time in history when comics were closer to literally extinction. Like, Brian or I could have woken up any day during that period due to a confluence of circumstances that, frankly, are rather dull to get into in depth, maybe as the topic of an entire podcast, but so many bad things were happening at once within the comics industry, it was hovering on the brink of just oblivion for about a year, the year in which I really got back into it, thanks to Brian. But I haven't talked about recent comics a lot, and there's a few reasons for that. Oh, boy. The primary reason is that, believe it or not, I subscribe to the adage, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all, especially when you've got a million dear, dear friends working their asses off at producing these comics, and they're facing off against every kind of horrific scumbag you could ever hope to confront. For some reason, fandom of video games, Star Wars, certainly, And unfortunately, very much video games, of course, and sadly, increasingly, comics have attracted a breed of, you know, there's this class of white male, almost exclusively. They're going through a sort of extinction event. They're not dying. But there are certain things in this world, particularly hobbies, especially those of sports and sort of nerdy fandom, that were virtually the sole province of white men. If any sort of racial or ethnic or sexual minority appeared, as late as 2009, and frankly, sadly, up until this very day, it's still a big deal. And the women and minorities, when they first appeared, were frankly written entirely by white men, and as such... Their characters are a little bit poisoned, like their origins come from a background of people who, look, it was a different time. I'm certainly not calling out some of the best writers of the silver and golden age of comic books and saying they're racist or sexist. They're not. They were fighting to get minorities and women into the pages of their books, but their understanding of these cultures was different than the way we understand our cultures today. So Luke Cage looks great on Netflix, but Google his first comic book appearances where he's wearing a yellow shirt, torn open down to the chest, a chain around his neck to symbolize, oh, I don't even want to think about what, and this weird freaky tiara around his forehead, and where he's such a a a-hole mercenary that at one point he hires himself out to Dr. Doom. He does eventually flip and fight him, but even then goes, there's a panel somewhere where you can see Luke Cage addressing Dr. Doom. This is like 1976, 77, and this has got to be one of the most cringeworthy dialogue panels of comic book history. He goes, where's my money, honey? Ugh. And it's just, oh, oh no. Oh, don't do that. No. So... I don't ever want to agree with these hateful people who are up in arms about realistic, diverse representation of different ethnicities, different genders, different sexualities. Representation for all in the pages of comics is to be lauded and is frankly necessary. It would be an atrocity to not pursue it. And at the same time, I don't want to lie and say, yeah, this piece of entertainment was really great. There was nothing wrong with the storytelling of Last Jedi. It's pacing, spot on. Ryan Johnson, you just keep upturning those expectations. Don't even worry about his story because the Porgs made it all okay. 
So you see, it, it's very difficult for me to voice an opinion about something as seemingly innocuous as comics because the air is just toxic with hate from people who are all about hating that which is not exactly like themselves, that I'm terrified of ever aligning myself with. And this is not all, I hate to say this, but the origins of this particular phenomenon in which we can only take one extreme side or the other, we can only love a mediocre story because it features minorities or women, or hate it because we're hateful people. My old friends at Sony, who have made sort of a cottage industry out of making legitimate reviews impossible for their less-than-perfect movies, of which there have been many, and of finding ways to delegitimize and defame the character of any reviewer who would dare say that there's something wrong with the Sony picture. And they really mastered this in 2016, when, I should stress, a man, a man whose work I've often admired in the past, the creator of Freaks and Geeks, or co-creator, Paul Feig, decided that although he'd taken a poll, you know, Sony had access to lots of data and nobody wanted the Ghostbusters brought back as a reboot under any circumstances. Harold Ramis was dead, Bill Murray's involvement was going to be minimal to none, and also it was many, many years after the phenomenon. Let some properties rest. Not everything needs to be a reboot. People were sick of that in general and were opposed to this idea. And he did a couple things, the first of which was he recast it with women, and that is actually completely, not that anyone should ever have to say this, but obviously that's fine. His script is problematic. About half the script says mug for the camera and improv off each other. And that, look, I don't know anybody who enjoyed that movie, and I would question the tastes of anyone who did. Now, I also take great umbrage with the many gross basement-dwelling misogynists who never saw it or saw it only to despise it for the sole reason that the stars of the movie were all women. So I'm kind of in a no-win situation. And Sony really intensified that atmosphere by, you know, the YouTube page of the trailer. The trailer was not good. The trailer was a harbinger of what the movie would be, which is garbage. And what they would do was they would take every comment that said, wow, this looks bad, and get rid of it. Similarly, they removed many comments. A lot of this came out, bizarrely enough, in the Korea hack a couple years ago. But it was obvious to me at the time anyway. That was just confirming stuff I already knew. They would also remove comments that said, huh, this looks pretty good. There were only two types of commenters in the entire comment thread of the trailer for Ghostbusters YouTube video. And this would set the tone for their entire publicity campaign. There was one type of commenter that said, oh my God, this looks so great. This looks 10 times better than the original. Who even was Harold Ramis? F him. Oh, this is the best. I can't wait. I'm saving my money now. I'm going to go 10 times. I know it for sure. And then there was another kind that were like, women belong in the kitchen and pregnant. I'm also not fond of Jews. And so there was just no middle ground to be had. And that was not an accident. Because if you were to come out and say, Paul Feig, your script is bad. Your instincts are failing you. Somebody... Boy, you know, you had a really good run there, but you're getting carried away with yourself. Somebody needs to rein you in, and no one at Sony has done so. So please, for the love of God, don't shit on Ghostbusters. That conversation could never be had. And uh, similarly, look, I don't feel anywhere near that kind of passion, good or bad, about Captain Marvel. But I'm not blown away by the trailer, by any means. The trailer literally opens with her crash landing. This is the least subtle thing I've ever seen in the opening of a movie trailer. Just to make sure we know that this takes place in the 90s, she crash lands from space into a blockbuster video chain. Get it? Remember the 90s there was blockbuster? Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, that's great. There are some other problems with the trailer. In particular, there's the fact that if you are not a die-hard Marvel Comics fan who's read most of, or at least their recent events, cover to cover, you would think that Captain Marvel is a giant asshole because there's a scene where she punches an old lady in the face on a bus, hard, with superpowers. Now, comic fans immediately get a hard-on and go, oh my god, that's, that's the Brian Bendis story about scrolls." Your average moviegoer, which makes up the overwhelming majority of people seeing this go, huh, so superheroes punch old ladies now? That's interesting. What else is going on? And the answer is not very much. Nick Fury, Samuel Jackson looking impressively young. The prosthetics and makeup certainly are not to be trifled with. 
particularly when it comes to Jackson as a young, two-eyed Nick Fury, who does most of the dialogue here. This is not unusual. It's not in any way diminishing of Captain Marvel as a character. Nick Fury has been, along with Agent Coulson, this kind of thread that sort of guides the moviegoer into the world of Marvel. Firstly, with the very idea of superheroes and introducing that via this weird espionage agency, S.H.I.E.L.D., it was very wise and continues to be a pretty good storytelling. Admittedly, it's becoming a bit of a crutch. Seeing Coulson at the end of every movie for a while, they're going, oh yeah, that's a hammer. Thor's gonna be the next movie. Got a little bit tiresome, but I understand that that is how they tell stories and introduce new characters and themes. Although, again, this is not a new character. This takes place in the 90s, and that's weird for other reasons, which I'm gonna have to get into in a moment. But first, let's see what Nick Fury has to say. War is a universal language. I know a renegade so too when I see one. Yeah, that's about as generic as action movie dialogue gets, but what are you going to do? He continues to speak. He expounds upon the glory days of space invasions and car chases where he almost dies. And boy, he thought those days were behind him. And thank God there's this strange being from the stars who he, for some reason, trusts completely, unlike every other superhero he encountered. And there's a much bigger problem with him being so accepting of Captain Marvel and of her existing at all in the 90s, which I'll get to in a moment. But let's just first meet the Captain. So you're not from around here. It's hard to explain. You know, the people who score movies and their trailers never get enough credit, but in this case, I will say there's no amount of credit that would do these people justice. That was the most unenthusiastic, unconvincing, boring exchange I've seen in a while. So thank God for that drum at the end to come in and let you know that this is something dramatic's happening. So Captain Marvel is a character. All right. Her character was written out of comics entirely for 30 years because she was written so badly with such a misogynistic tone by, I'm sure, well-intentioned writers. But just as a sample of what happened with her, she was depowered, had her powers stolen by the soon-to-be X-Man rogue when she was still evil, when they still called bad guys evil, and was subsequently raped by a time-traveling space creature. And rather than do something about it, she chose to carry the baby who was actually the alien himself, it's a whole thing, to term, and go be a happy, depowered, violated mother of a monster. And this rubbed everyone with a conscience and any respect for women so wrong that, you know, I've referred to doing the men in black thing, like, just get this out of my mind. We have to forget that this ever happened. Marvel really did that. The existence of Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel, played by Brie Larson, who looks great. I mean, she's a wonderful actress. I've got every reason to believe she'll carry the role as best she can. As well as the character can be played, Brie Larson's the one to do it. But it's unfortunate because I don't think the movie's going to do well, at least critically. And so it's a shame. You know, I mean, she'll be paid very well and she'll be in subsequent movies. She's guaranteed to be in Avengers 4 and I'm sure she'll shine in that. But see, that's the problem I've been alluding to this whole time. Remember how when Iron Man debuted, it was this shock that, oh my God, there could be somewhat supernatural things going on in the world. This was how the Marvel Cinematic Universe came to be. You know, there had been a Hulk, but much like Carol Danvers and Ms. Marvel in the comics... The Hulk had been largely forgotten about by the populace because Marvel wanted you to forget about Edward Norton's not-so-great Hulk movie. So the Hulk was frozen, and, you know, several movies later, if Iron Man worked, Thor, Captain America, etc., he'd be dethawed and recast for the Avengers, which did happen. But as far as the cinematic universe and the foundation of believability and storytelling on which it was built, this was the dawn of superheroics. So the idea that suddenly there's this whole backstory where all through the 90s there were superheroes and the Kree Scroll War, which is something you should Google and read if you haven't already. It's one of the best, most legendary, iconic Avengers stories of all time. And it's the inspiration for another story that is clearly being used here. But the Kree Scroll War is taking place on Earth and somehow we'll still be shocked when a man carves a suit of armor 
and is able to shoot beams from his hands. And we're terrified when the Avengers get together, which they have to do to fight off the first ever alien invasion, which is so traumatizing that all of Iron Man 3 is about Tony Stark having the least convincing case of PTSD I've ever seen depicted on film. As someone who actually lives with PTSD, I found that movie insulting. But again, the point is, aliens, superheroes, they're a phenomenon that began at the earliest in 2008, with the one noteworthy and already kind of awkwardly managed exception of Captain America. So how can it be that there's this entire decade, 20 years prior, in which there's a a war between two rival alien species, the Kree and the Skrull, We've actually seen a couple of Kree. Uh, Ronan the Accuser from Guardians of the Galaxy is a Kree. I think there were a few other Kree in that film as well, or Volume 2. And a war takes place, and we're saved by a superhero, and somehow we forget it. Now, it's conceivable that they'll do some awful cop-out at the end and do the Men in Black stick and wipe everyone's mind. But what's much more likely, I should give you a spoiler alert, because I I sort of have figured out what I think is happening here. First off, pause and wait until I'm done with this story until you've watched Avengers Infinity War. But at the end of Infinity War, things seem quite dire, and what appears to be happening is that Doctor Strange has cursed one of the Infinity Stones, specifically the Time Stone, and in so doing created an alternate past And that's what we're going to see in this movie. So Captain Marvel, the character, is once again being really abused because a superhero is a great thing to be. A MacGuffin is not so great. A MacGuffin is a storytelling element introduced so that you can form a narrative. Captain Marvel is being created so that Avengers 4 can make sense. That is a real disservice to the character, a real disservice to Brie Larson, the entire cast and crew of the film, and everyone who's going to go out on opening night and see it in 3D and 4D and IMAX and everything else. So that's very disappointing. So that's my take on Captain Marvel. I'm sorry to say I would much rather have only positive things to say about movies, comics, and oh, don't even get me started on the comic. I, I didn't want to go here, but just real quick before I go. In the ramp up, to the film and to get people sort of interested in the character of Carol Danvers and Captain Marvel. There's a mini series currently being published called The Life of Captain Marvel, which is a play on the name The Death of Captain Marvel, this really great graphic novel, which is what they used to call comics more than 30 pages printed on deluxe paper in the early 80s, in which the original Captain Marvel, a Cree named Marvel, boy, you know, coincidences in comics, you've got to suspend a lot of disbelief. So, you know, take everything I just said, all the cynicism about Captain Marvel with a grain of salt, because this is all silliness. Let's be clear about that. But... They got very serious with the death of Captain Marvel. It was about this Kree superhero, Captain Marvel, and his losing battle and death from cancer. It doesn't get much more dark and serious than that. The life of Captain Marvel is weird. We go back to the PTSD route in which we see Captain Marvel fighting alongside Iron Man. They're fighting side by side, and for whatever reason, she goes nuts and just goes really over the top, beating an enemy to a pulp. And he goes, whoa, whoa, what's up with you? What's wrong? And she just won't stop kicking the guy's ass. And she goes, oh, you know, I'm really upset because my dad did something once. And he goes, okay, you have family-induced PTSD. Now, again, this might strike me a little bit more crass than it strikes most people because I am a sufferer and you don't get diagnosed by a friend and it's not a minor deal and it doesn't manifest in such a silly, you know, again, it's comics and therefore sometimes if they don't know how to address a topic, they probably should leave it alone. They should have left sexual assault alone, and they should leave PTSD alone. It doesn't get more offensive from there, but it does get stupider. He tells her that the best thing to do with this family-induced PTSD is to go back and reunite with her family. And up till now, we haven't really known that much about her family. We know that she was an Air Force soldier and from there became a pilot and, you know, that part of her life. But her childhood, what about that? Well, she's from Boston. And how do we know? Well, she flies to Boston and that ought to be enough. Okay, she's from Boston. Let's see how it goes. But no, suddenly her nickname is Beans. And everyone's going, Era Beans, welcome back there, Era. I hear you've been fighting the Ara aliens. And she's immediately going, Ara, yes, I need to eat beans. But first, where's my brother? And of course, her brother, I mean, I'm not joking. Her brother is in a car driving off a bridge. We're just taking every Massachusetts cliche and... Again, throwing subtlety right out the window. Era, it's the Chappaquiddick. 
He does a header off a bridge, and she. I tuned out somewhere in issue two after the 50th person called her beans, and she had to go get her Boston baked pie. I just couldn't handle it anymore. And in what is ostensibly the fleshing out of this character, it's just cliche after cliche after cliche. It's exhausting. So if nothing else, I'm sure the Captain Marvel movie will be better than the life of Captain Marvel. And I truly believe the character will have a great future, and Brie Larson's going to kick ass in Avengers 4, Captain Marvel 2, probably Avengers 5 through 9. You know, they don't take these characters and just sign them on for a project. She's going to lead the way for Marvel for years to come. And as such, she deserves a better introduction, just like Thor did. But this looks worse than the first Thor movie. This looks legitimately like a snoozer. And that's a shame. And I'm really sorry to everyone involved because I, I hate to criticize stuff that people I know are kind of involved with. And I want so badly for Captain Marvel to be good. So I am holding out hope that that will be the case. In the meantime, it's new comic book day, and I'm going to read the comics I picked up today, which include Batman Damned, which, boy, talk about subtlety, features full frontal nudity from Batman. That's right. Oh, but wait, the digital edition, DC decided it was too shocking for digital readers. So if you're reading via Comixology or the DC Comics app or DC Universe, you don't see full frontal Batman nudity. right the plot thickens anyway i'm gonna sign off but first let me congratulate i've got a winner for one of my two trivia contests i've been running the one that i aired last night which was better call saul related i asked what does the foreman of gus's crew that's working on building the meth lab for him what does he tell mike that his last name ermintrout means in german and Tina Spangler of San Francisco, congratulations. You were the first one to respond. So get back to me and tell me what you'd like me to plug and when you'd like to appear on the show with me. The prize for these trivia questions is free airtime on the podcast with me to plug anything you like, talk about anything you like, as long as you just don't get me threatened. I've already received enough threatening DMs and I anticipate many more after talking about Captain Marvel, both from the people writing the comics who are my friends who are going to be pissed at me and from the Nazis who I've decried. I've just made an enemy out of a lot of people tonight. So when you come on the show, plug your business as long as it's not like racist business, sexist business, hateful business hyper-partisan business, anything that is just hateful. It's got to be legal, and I'm sorry. I don't mean to be such a wiener about it, but it's got to be kind of nice. But do get in touch with me, Tina. You answered correctly. The answer to what does Ermintraut mean in German, according to the foreman of Gus's crew. Ermintraut in German, it comes from two words. World plus strength. Yeah, I guess. What's the latest? It's all about Mike's response. That just makes the scene. But yes, it means world-class strength. So congratulations, Tina. You kicked ass, and I look forward to having you on the show. Get in touch with me as soon as possible. I'll give out that contact info in a moment. In the meantime, I just want to reiterate, I've got another trivia contest going that so far no one has answered correctly. So this is your chance. The BoJack Horseman Show, a plot device used in BoJack Horseman Season 3 that was based on a real TV show that, like the BoJack Horseman Show, was a failure from a former television star that nearly torpedoed the actor's career. Tell me the name of the show. It aired on Fox in 2007, and you too, like Tina, can be a guest on my show to promote your business, your podcast, propose to a loved one. For some reason, I really want someone to propose on my show. I just think that would be really cool. Or just, you know, tell your mom you love her, what have you. It's free airtime for you to do anything you like that's non-hateful. And the way in which you can get in touch with me, both to answer that question or for any other reason, is via email, matt at mattsager.com, or call 646-535-4788, or hit me up on social media. Twitter is at Matt Sager, Instagram's Real Matt Sager, Facebook The Matt Sager, my voiceover page is Matt Sager VO, and this podcast's page is Matt Sager Podcast. And I've got many more social media links, as well as blog posts, articles, my voiceover reels, more contact information, archive episodes of this podcast, and a whole lot more. You can find all of that on my website, mattsagervoiceover.com. 